Hi, my name is Tori Schindler-Cox, and I'm the Virginia G. Schrader Curator of Art at the Evansville Museum. And today we have Brooke with us, and she's going to tell us about who she is and what she does and uh, how her profession is changing due to the current circumstances. So, Brooke, thank you for your time. Hi, how are you? Well, well how about yourself? I'm hanging in there. I'm, li I'm right in the center in Ground Zero, right in Manhattan. So it's, uh, life's been pretty interesting. Pretty interesting. Um, I guess I'll just start off and sort of explain who I am, what I do, um, for those of us out there who maybe aren't as familiar with architectural conservation. Um, it's very different than museum conservation. Um, we have different degrees, although we work collaboratively uh, at my company, we do have fine arts conservators on staff. Um, but uh, I initially wanted to pursue a degree in fine arts conservation. And, um, but what happened was, is I just, it's such a rigorous program to get into. And um, after doing several internships within um, fine arts conservation, I did a, um, a pre, what they call pre-program internship at the Walters Art Museum in Baltimore um, and their paintings conservation lab. I realized that um, I really wanted to do something a little bit more integrated with the built environment. And so luckily Columbia University has a wonderful historic preservation program. Um, there are two current schools that, well, there are many historic preservation programs across the US. There are two schools that are probably the forerunners of um, architectural conservation. And that's um, Columbia University and U University of Pennsylvania. So I went through the Columbia program um, which was like not too shabby um, <laughs> at all and uh, concentrated. So my degree is actually a historic preservation degree with a concentration in conservation. And with that, um, I was able to blend in my love of painting um, and murals um, and apply that onto an architectural surface and an architectural context. So while my background's very, very broad, I can do anything from working on um, monuments, stone, uh, brick, terracotta, all the way to, uh, all the way up to murals on the interiors, um, even paintings on canvas. I prefer actually, my niche is within more interior environments, um, working on paint and plaster. And so oftentimes I will be employed to uh, work on job sites where, sort of part of my, the company I work for um, is one of the largest conservation employers in architectural conservation. Um, the company is called Evergreen Architectural Arts. Um, and we have acquired a wonderful firm in DC uh, a couple of years ago called Conservation Solutions. So we are our own little division. Well, it's not a little division, it's a large division of um, about 50 people who uh, are dedicated to conservation within the built environment. And within that, each of us have our own niches. And so my niche is um, paint investigation and mural conservation. And so paint invest, I mean, mural conservation is pretty much, I mean, that's self-explanatory, but paint investigation um, is essentially where I will go into a building and attempt to find the target layers um, of paint on a wall or on any architectural surface. Um, and that could mean anything from sponge painting from the 30s all the way up to decorative stenciling to um, sometimes there's large scale uh, trompe l'oeil, um, which I've worked on in um, a couple scenarios, faux paneling, faux, you know, fake, like wood, fake wood finishes. I mean, the, the gamut is, it, the spectrum is enormous. So that's basically what I do. And then um, more specifically, I go on site. I take paint samples. Those samples are un analyzed. Uh, we do not do um, pigment analysis or uh, like high level, I'll say high level uh, bench device type laboratory analysis. We send those samples out. We want to understand what the media is. For example, is it a distemper paint? Is it an oil paint? But there are clues that we have. We, have a, we use UV. Um, and visible light and microscopes. And that can give us enough information to go off of for replication in the future or just for documentation purposes. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> that's really, that's amazing. <laughs> yeah, that's, my, that's my spiel. Wow. <laughs> yeah. And so um, in order to, uh, it's, it's difficult to get into architectural finishes because 
it's not necessarily a focus in the schools. Um, they, of course, it's part of the package that you get. It's part of the basic, the basic training that you get, but it's not a focus because of course, most buildings, be, because, and this is why it's so important that um, we have people who do finish his analysis, because the interiors of building are the most ephemeral. And people look at a lot of historic structures, and of course, if the roof goes, the first thing to go is all the paint and plaster. Yeah. So it makes these finishes all the more um, precious. And so the fact that I work for a company who's like one of our focuses is to either restore or recreate or conserve these finishes is, it's a, it's a real joy. I, ha I, I, I live a very joyous existence because uh, to me those, it's one of the most um, humane portions of the building mm -hmm. because it's oftentimes, particularly in vernacular architecture, a lot of these buildings obviously are built by architects, but may not be reflective of the people who were living within them. Yeah. So when yeah. you start studying the finishes, particularly like there's um, some amazing work, not work that I have done, but amazing work out there on tenements in Manhattan. Um, Stephanie Hoagland Bond of, John, of Jablonski um, Building Conservation has done phenomenal work in this area. Um, so you really begin to see who the people are who lived in these buildings, you know, however temporary. And there's a real uh, humanity to it. Um, you know, I see fingerprints and paint. I see, uh, you know, uh, stencils that are left behind that are hidden behind panels. I, you really begin to see not only just the craftsmanship, but the, the who lived there and why did they choose this finish? Why did they choose that color? Why did they do this room in this manner? And it's, um, and so you feel really in touch with history, more so than just, you know, cleaning stone, you know? Not to be patronizing to people who work on stone, because that's above my head. But for me, there's just a, a, a such a human connection with with the past. Yeah, yeah. I never thought of it like that, um, because you'll hear me talk about a lot how why I love my job so much is I get to work with these tangible objects that are acquisitions of memories and pasts, and they're visual time capsules and they're vehicles for storytelling. And I never mm. thought of that same concept being applied to architecture conservation. That's brilliant. Yeah, thank you. Well, wow, thank you. <laughs> That's my one brilliant moment for the day. <laughs> <laughs> I've served my purpose. I can go now. <laughs> no, it, it is, you know, it's true. I think because people are enveloped in buildings, oftentimes they get lost in buildings and they don't see um, that humanity. They don't see that, that, portion of history, they, they understand that an, an event occurred there, but there's no evidence of that event. I mean, when you see, um, you know, when you look at the, uh, you look at old letters, for example, I mean, that's a, that's an, a tangible, um, that's a tangible piece of history. You see the signature, you see the handwriting. It's, there's very, something very individualistic about it. But when you're walking through stone, marble, you know, marble hallways, there's not a lot of, there's individuality in the design, but not in, in the actual people who walked through those halls. When you go to, you know, George Washington's Mount Vernon, okay, that's a different story. You're like, all right, well, he selected these very specific colors for this room. He selected um, this specific wallpaper for this area and, and why, and, and what was that saying, and what did it say about the times, and so on and so forth. I mean, and it goes, runs the gamut all the way from slaves quarters, you know, in, in South Carolina, all the way up to, you know, the, the wealthiest, most privileged houses um, in the United States. And I think it's a real shame. I, I, I got interested in architectural conservation because when I was 14 years old, I had the opportunity to go to Russia during perestroika. So I'm 40 and um, I went, or it was just after perestroika rather, it was nine, 1993, so I was 13 years old. And I remember I had, instead of sending me to St. Petersburg, the government just like changed their mind and they were like, okay, well, you're gonna go um, to Zagorsk, which is like three or four hours outside Moscow, I think. I have actually no idea exactly where I was. They put us in the back of the car and drove us. It was kind of terrifying. Um, but I was 13 and I was also like really angsty. So I'm like, this is awesome. You know, I'm out of my parents' house. Anyway, it's like, oh, I digress. So I hope you can edit me out. <laughs> I'll start to um, 
walking through the countryside, I saw a Galitzin palace and I realized it was abandoned. And that's where I started getting like hot on ruin porn because I'd never seen anything like that. You know, in the United States, I grew up around history. I grew up on the East Coast. So I'm used to 18th century buildings. Like I'm very familiar with them. Um, having grown up in Maryland, there's a lot of, you know, we're very lucky with a lot of 18th century history. They're earlier 17th century history too, um, in some instances. And um, I'd never seen 18th century history look like that before. Mm -hmm. And it was really astonishing to me because it was abandoned. They had peeled the gold off of the onion dome. Um, you could walk right up to it and you could see they had a conservatory. You could see the ballroom. I mean, it was really just, it was just left there. And, you know, and then we're continuing on our walk and there were abandoned factories. And it was like, oh my God, like this, this history is just rotting here. It's, and in some way it was preservation by neglect and in other ways it was demolition by neglect. But um, when I looked into these houses, I was, or this, rather this um, palace, this country palace, I was just like, oh my God, but all of this interior history is gonna be gone. Mm -hmm. And so when I had the opportunity to um, explore that more um, in grad school, it meant a lot to me. I mean, my dad would like, we would go on like, you know, like we didn't go to like theme parks. We would go to graveyards and look at our ancestors' graves or we went to um, Rosewell, which is a ancestors, you know, I, I have white history obviously. So, um, you know, there's some some difficult history in my, my family's past. And, but we went to Rosewell, which is an early um, planner's house plantation. And it was just rotting. It was before any historic preservation efforts had been made to take care of it. And I just looked at these these things. And, and when you see something so naked and so bare, you can really see the hands that went into it mm -hmm. and the quality that went into it. Because I think there's a certain amount of like, um, like if you go to like Charleston, which is such a beautiful, beautiful, beautiful city, it's very anesthetized because it's been restored to such a pristine level. But if you go to like Savannah, for example, it's still a little dirty. It's still a little, there's a patina to it, you know? And you're like, okay, like that feels very human. And so I was able to apply that to my career. I mean, that's pretty awesome. Oh, absolutely. Now, out of curiosity, how many sites do you go to each year? Well, Let's see, I probably go, oh, that's a really good question. I've never thought about that. Um, I was traveling quite a bit before I got, um, before I was pregnant, but I mean, I would say I was probably traveling, last year I traveled pro almost six months out of the year. So it's, it's very intermittent. And so I would travel anywhere from, um, you know, from Dallas. I was traveling a lot to Dallas. I was traveling a lot to Baltimore. We had a job in Baltimore that was very near and dear to my heart, um, having grown up there. Um, we were traveling, I, you know, I was told you I'd been to Duluth. Um, I mean, I've been to, I haven't been all the way out to California yet, but I've been to Chicago. I've been, I've been to like all these crazy, you know, random theaters in, in Western Pennsylvania, I, um, Catholic churches, it's all over the country. So, I mean, I could work on as many as 12 sites within a year easily, because like I said, I'm in the front lines. So one of the beautiful things about Evergreen, at least in my, my niche, is that I find these, I make these discoveries and then maybe the client wants to replicate those discoveries. Ooh. And so then I have a full um, team of mural painters and decorative painters and designers who can make that happen. So uh, like, me Unlike other companies where they go in and they do the paint analysis um, and they do paint reveals, which is when you remove the layers of paint or remove the paint layer by layer down to whatever the target finishes, depending on the interpretation, the age of interpretation of the building. Um, you know, you don't necessarily always get to watch that process unfold. You're kind of removed then. Okay, you've done your job. Like, so maybe you get to go back in a couple of years or 10 years or whenever the project's done and say, wow, okay, you know, I helped 
I helped find this, you know, I helped make this uh, revisible. But um, in my company, I get to help along that process soup to nuts. So I did a, a couple, a uh, couple jobs at the New York Public Library. The, uh, yeah, yeah, the Ghostbusters building. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, which is really cool. And so um, we've done a lot of work there. Um, but I got to work on the North Stair and I got to work on a, uh, another um, stairwell. I'm having pregnancy brain right now. I'm blanking on the name. McGraw, the McGraw Stair. And, you know, when I'm doing paint reveals, I found in the McGraw Stair this uh, stencil. And it occurred to me that I might have been the first person in 70 years to see this stencil. Yeah, I know. And you're just like, it's treasure hunting. It's like Indiana Jones, but for, um, you know, architectural finishes. And um, so we were able to recreate that. We protected the original. Um, and then we recreated what it was using, um, you know, non-VOC. Because of course, that's always the big issue, right? You can't recreate it exactly as it was historically because of uh, the volatile organic compounds. And you're in an active space, which is another thing that, that can be problematic. Um, and it's just, it's a delight. People are like, oh my gosh, why would people paint over that? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So it's, it is really fun that I get to be a part of that entire process and micromanage it, <laughs> you <Yeah>. know? <laughs> like, come on guys, we gotta make this, it's, that's, that color's too brown or that color's too orange or that's not right, you know? Yeah, yeah. so it is really fun. You call me red. And how long have you been doing this? Well, I started in conservation. Um, I, got, I got fired, I was working in fashion mm -hmm. and I got fired in 2006. For good reason, I was being a real butt. <laughs> <laughs> I was I was being very insubordinate because I didn't, you know, I'm 20, I'm 20, what was who I was 26 years old mm -hmm. and um, I was atrophied. I felt so bored. And um, you know, when you're 26 years old and you're you think you know everything and um, you're entitled, uh, mm -hmm. you you don't act appropriately, and I was very inappropriate. So I deserve to get fired. And I tell people this all the time. It's the best gift that was ever given to me because it really made me, it was the second time I'd been fired in, um, in three years. And I had, you know, I had to have a real sit and think about it and realize, oh, this, maybe I'm not in the right career field. Like at this point, my resume is in the can, you know, like if you've been fired twice in three years, like that's a good indication that, or in four years or whatever, that's a good indication that you should probably just move on. Mm -hmm. And so I've been working in this field tw either towards being a conservator or as a conservator since um, 2006. Wow. Yeah, yeah, it takes a long time. It takes a long time to accrue all of the uh, qualifications to get into school. It makes sense. So did you have a degree in fashion and then switch to Columbia's program or how did that work for you? Actually, I did probably what you did. I studied art history. Um, my father uh, was a lawyer, but he really is an art historian. And um, he and my mom, my mom's very interested in decorative finishes and, uh, you know, or not decorative, excuse me, decorative objects. And my father is very interested in, um, particularly in Chinese painting um, and, um, and the old masters. So I grew up being kind of, well, it was a deluge of, <laughs> of art. And um, thankfully, and so I always had like a very artistic, I, I make, you know, not now because I live in Manhattan, I have no space, but um, you know, I, I made art uh, my entire life. And so I, um, it was an easy way for me to kind of segue into because it was sort of like art had given me so much. So I really wanted to have the opportunity. I know that sounds so like, oh, but <laughs> you know, it, it, art had given me a lot. I mean, it, it really had, and, and it had educated me and taught me about U.S. history, which I was, oh, I've always struggled with and so on and so forth. I wanted to be able to get back to that field. And when I walked into um, my first conservation lab, I was like, it was a true vocation. It was like, I'm a nun in the 15th century and God just called me and this is my job now. You know what I mean? It was like, that's what it felt like. It was like, I was so drawn to it and I just it was a no-brainer at that point so I took all of my savings and um, took all the chemistry I could and 
all, took my GRE classes and, um, and, and just, <laughs> and just made my parents very nervous and, um, and stayed in New York and, and took internship after internship after internship. Wow. Yeah. 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 But you know, I was very interested in going to Johns Hopkins from, for, uh, grad school for art history and working with Stephen Campbell. Oh, hey. <laughs> yeah. My man, Stephen Campbell. Because I was like really into like Rosso Fiorentino. So I was like, oh, I want to work with Stephen Campbell, you know. But uh, mm -hmm. I tried writing an undergraduate thesis in art history and it was an abject failure. And I was just like, yeah, it was pretty bad. So <laughs> <laughs> I don't think this is, I don't think I'm a writer. <laughs> <laughs> That's a huge portion of what I do. So yeah, it's, it's funny because uh, I don't know if you keep up with um, cinema, but I remember sitting in a theater after I came home from some study abroad and I was watching Transformers and there was this lady with her hair up in a bun with her little Starbucks coffee walking around giving a tour and she was the curator that was highlighted in that movie. Yeah. Oh no, that's like maybe 5% of what I do on a daily basis. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. It's not, it's, that's not accurate at all. It's sort of, well, it's the same thing. Like, um, like in Ghostbusters 2, second Ghostbusters reference for the day, by the way, that doesn't happen. In <laughs> Ghostbusters 2 and Sigourney Weaver is like working on the paintings. Like you don't just like work on a painting. You don't go from like working in the orchestra <laughs> and then go and just become a conservator. Like, it's like, that doesn't just happen. I, it's really funny how people view um, our jobs. Mm -hmm. uh, because based on what they've read or whatever and like you know in books that's not the main focus of the of the plot line per se is to explain how these how these people get their jobs and put people to sleep but um it's it is really funny like we we deal a lot right now um with uh social media and sort of the misrepresentation there's um there's a guy who I'm not going to say his name but he does um, a lot of treatments. He will put a lot of his treatments online. And that's a huge ethical issue for us as conservators because you're basically telling the public that you can do this at home and therefore you don't need our expertise. And even worse than that is you could be doing damage on these pieces mm -hmm. and irreparable damage. And um, I can't tell you how many times I've come across works of art that have been worked on by novices, and that's not to disregard their talent in other spheres, but um, it, 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 you can't fix something that broken sometimes, and it's, it can be really disastrous. Mm -hmm. And it's just very cavalier, I think. And so, you know, one of the main jobs of this organization, the American Institute of Architects, I'm American Institute of Architects, good Lord, Brooke, the American Institute of Conservation um, is to educate the public about the importance of, of of utilizing a trained conservator. Um, you know, it's sort of, I can't think of an analogy for, for curators, but I mean, I'm sure it's sort of like having somebody with some wackadoo associates degree in whatever, and they come up with these crazy theories that are based on really poorly researched or not, you know, um, primary um, archival research. And they come up with these theories and they make that, you know, well, carved in stone like that's what it is mm -hmm. it's kind of similar to that it's it's really really infuriating because mm -hmm. mm -hmm. there's so much damage control you have to do yeah. and now it's on the internet I can't tell you how many videos I get of this dude and I'm just like no <laughs> people are like oh but it's so satisfying to watch I'm like no <laughs> <laughs> Not when it's uh, the destruction of beautiful pieces of artwork. So, <laughs> no, I, I mean, in the and to be fair, like you can't see that. It's often on a on a microscopic level. Mm -hmm. But you know that that it just it just it just uh, speeds up the decay, <laughs> the object. Yeah, which is what we're trying, curator and conservator, to either prevent um, or definitely de-escalate to the best of our ability. Stewardship is one of the most important things. And that relationship between curator and conservator and having that mutual respect. I mean, I've, I've certainly witnessed in museums where that, um, relationship is strained because everybody has their own ego, but where it really works, it works so beautifully. And, and, and there's a real, um, there's a real force there for, for preserving um, 
cultural heritage. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And speaking with digitalization, um, how is your field being affected with the um, current crisis that is going on? Well, so right now we're really fortunate because we are a, um, nationwide. So um, we have probably about 25 projects, I believe between 15 and I, I think it's between 15 and 25 projects going on right now. Um, at any, you know, which is a reduced number from what we usually have. Um, most of those projects are not conservation, they're restoration based. Um, so there are bread and butter, which is, you know, a lot of plaster work um, and a lot of decorative painting and a lot of mural work. Because um, we do do everything from new builds to, to restoration um, and conservation. So um, those fortunately are not being affected, but of course what is affecting it is the lack of um, personal pre uh, protective equipment. So PPE. And when this enormous surge, which just enraged me so much, of people purchasing dust masks, which right now we have to use because right we don't have the proper um, equipment to be able to protect ourselves from this virus. But people went on a map just out of ignorance. They didn't know <laughs> that these dust masks are really only going to protect the person you're talking to. They may not protect you. Um, they keep you from touching your face, which is good, but it's not going to prohibit droplets of water containing the, you know, coming from your mouth, containing the virus. It's not going to necessarily uh, be the same level of protection. It's just not the appropriate tool for the, um, for the need. And so we had to, sh we've been struggling for about a, uh, almost a month with that. So a lot of our guys have had to be reusing dust masks. <sighs> Um, and sites had to be shut down um, because they're around things like asbestos and lead and um, silica. And um, you need those specific masks for those specific types of um, uh, toxins and not toxins, what's the word for it, but um, dangers, we'll just say. And well, I mean, I guess there are toxins, but so that's been, that's been a huge, um, hugely, a, a huge problem for us. The other problem, of course, is because we don't work within laboratories. I mean, obviously the museums are shut down now. Um, we, uh, our job sites are our laboratory. And so those, many of those have been shut down. So most of our workers right now, um, as, as we're trying to find as much, keep people as busy as possible, but that also means travel, right? A lot of people, some of our uh, more senior people um, who run job sites are in their 60s and they don't, you know, are in their 50s or 60s and they don't feel comfortable traveling. So they're on unemployment right now, um, which is, you know, really heartbreaking. Um, you know, they're just trying to get by. Uh, a lot of like our conservation team, we have a team of technicians who do the, who do a lot of the hands-on work um, are, are on an unemployment right now. Um, cause the company's just right now, cause at any point in time, we could have between 150 and 200 employees based upon, cause we hire everything from like union employees to, cause we work with the unions to, um, what we call just like, uh, hourly people. Um, and so it's been, it's been a huge blow, an enormous blow. Mm -hmm. Um, and people are just trying to stay afloat right now. And so my managers are working really, really diligently in my upper, with my upper management to find ways to, um, where we can contribute, um, to the company, maybe not, um, hands-on in the field, but maybe like, this is a really good time for us to focus on our website and make sure that all of the conservation pages on the website are up to date and there weren't. So that's really good. So they're trying to, so right now it's, it's been a good thing because we are such a divided company. Um, I guess the corporate term is siloed um, that right now we're being more collaborative than ever because all the managers are talking to one another, trying to resolve ways to keep us people like myself employed. Um, and all that can do is just make me all the more loyal for this company towards this company because I really feel like they're doing the best they can to take care of us and not just us in New York, but us nationwide. Mm -hmm. So yeah, it's, it's definitely affected. I mean, it's affected everybody, but 
you know, I mean, us particularly in the in the museum industry um, have been hugely affected um, without, you know, funding people coming by and seeing seeing the museums, visiting the museums. That's what most of the museums thrive off of, survive off of. Uh, it's it's got to be really scary for for you guys too. Yeah, but like you said, there are silver linings to this, and um, now that we have the time to work on our digital uh, content as what we're doing right now. Um, it's yielding some very interesting opportunities that we just wouldn't have the time to do or the manpower. And yeah. getting that digital footprint is extremely important because we need to be able to be more accessible to align with those AAM standards of getting your content out there. But when you're a single department head, it's really difficult at times. And I feel like that's a, that is an excuse to an extent, but you always have this going on in the office, that going on in the mm -hmm. office, you need to look at the tangible objects because that is what I'm supposed to do, that it's hard to balance what you're supposed to do in-house versus what you're supposed to do in the digital content. So really at this point, um, I am glad that we're, at least the silver lining aspect, I'm glad that we're able to dedicate this time to building this footprint for the museum because we're gonna archive all of this, everything that we're doing, and that's going to be relevant and we're going to be able to share that for years, decades, more to come. So. Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, I noticed that like um, the Baltimore Heritage is doing like a five minute, what is it? Like five minute history on um, landmark buildings in Baltimore. Mm -hmm. And that's been really, really great. Um, I just think there are all these really great ways that people can utilize this time to promote um, the good that they do for the communities. Um, we're obviously a for-profit company, so we don't do any good for anything. Now I'm just kidding, but like we, but we are a for-profit company. So, but I think like doing things like this is great. Like just promoting conservation and the importance of conservation. I get into arguments all the time on uh, with people because they're so unfamiliar with uh, the importance of trying to preserve interior spaces. Um, you know, it's, it's shocking to me. There's probably like 5,000 New York City landmarks and a couple hundred uh, interior landmarks. In fact, the Rose Reading Room, which, you know, is the big reading room at the New York Public Library, was just an interior, like the Rose Reading Room and Bill Blass was just made interior landmark like a couple years ago. Oh. And it's one of the most important interiors, you know, in New York City. Mm -hmm. So I think that also speaks volumes about how, um, you know, people like myself have to really fight for these interiors. So I call it the, the West Village syndrome, where people mm -hmm. will take these beautiful townhouses and, you know, who, who am I? I can't go up to them and say, don't do this. I mean, I can, I'll just look like a crazy person though. And they bomb out the interior, they gut the interior, they throw a glass um, wall on the back of the house, you know, of an 1850s, 1860s Italian at Brownstone, and it's completely inappropriate, but they've maintained the facade. So for landmarking purposes, that's fine, because the facade is maintained. And so then you're only maintaining really one quarter of the integrity of the house. It's, it's, and so you lose like all of this important information about how people decorated their houses. We have ideas, but we don't know for sure. Merchant's House Museum in, on um, East 4th Street is another great example. They did tons of paint studies in there, thinking they were gonna find all these elaborate stencils because of the time period of the house. It's, it's a federal into Greek revival house. And of course it maintained, it stayed in the family from that period, I think it's 1840 up until 1930 when it was gifted to the um, to the city as a house museum. And if you're unfamiliar with it, highly, highly recommend going because it's really, really cool. It's kind of like a, a curator's dream because they were gifted everything that was in the house. I mean, you're smiling because it's like, you know what I'm talking about. Like that never happens as a unicorn. Well, so they're expecting they're gonna have all this fancy stuff in there because it was an upper middle class um, merchant who owned this house, built this house, but what they, people, the knowledge that was gleaned from it was so interesting because it's like, just because they were wealthy didn't mean they wanted to show off that wealth. Mm -hmm. 
And so the finishes are really austere. It's really just like paint color and beautiful plaster. It's not, there's no stenciling, there's no weird glazing or anything like that. And so it was really, there's just so much more information that needs to be researched, so much more work that needs to be done. Mm. And, um, you know, we can't do that work, obviously, if the stuff gets stripped out. So it, I think it's great, like during these, having these opportunities during um, slower periods or uh, where we can start really making, raising a racket because we're not distracted by all the day-to-day -day tasks we have to do. Mm -hmm. oh, absolutely. Yeah. Mm. Well, is there anything else you'd like to add or tell our viewers? Um, I would just say, like, I really appreciate uh, the opportunity to be able to talk about what I do. Um, I'm crazy about it. It's, um, I feel honored that I get to work in the work that I do, and I feel really happy that there's a space in our country where we're able to to work on this stuff having you know been through like when i was talking about russia like at the time they they obviously had larger economic hurdles to 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 deal with and and the fact that in our country we have these opportunities i mean we have to continually fight for them because they're constantly trying to defund it but that we have these opportunities to be able to focus on our on our heritage and preserve our heritage. And um, I just think that's really awesome. So I was really glad that I had this opportunity to speak with you about, about a different aspect of, of preserving heritage. Oh, no, absolutely. And again, we appreciate you and your time. Uh, this is a whole unique opportunity because we don't really get to talk to conservators that often. So I well, don't- let me know. I know lots of them. <laughs> I'll follow up on that. Yeah, let me know. Absolutely. Well, again, thank you for your time. And this is an Evansville Museum recording. And Brooke, thank you again. And don't be a stranger and we'll have to talk soon. So I look forward to it. Thank you. Mm -hmm.